Hello and welcome to a brand new episode of Smart Money. Now on the show this week, we talk to Edelweiss about the launch of India's first passive short-term index fund. I know that's a mouthful, but this is an investment option suitable for any kind of debt investor wanting to invest for a minimum of two to three years with a low cost. Today, we try and understand more about this investment asset class and how you can add it to your own portfolio. Radhika Gupta, the MD and CEO of Edelweiss Asset Management joins in now to talk about that. Radhika, thanks so much for joining us on the show today. Uh, you know, first, let's start off with the overarching theme, right? Passive funds. I want to try and understand a little bit about how uh, one can add passive funds to their portfolio, especially at a challenging time like this, when there's so much uncertainty globally. So I think passive funds and products options have really grown in the Indian context. And today, whether it's equity or debt, you have a very wide range of passive funds. Uh, and I truly believe passive funds, especially fixed income passive funds, can now become the core of your fixed income investing. Between target maturity funds, which we've talked about and can touch upon, and newly launched other kind of debt funds like this, all your goals can now be filled by passive funds with a lot of transparency as well as low cost in the fixed income format and your entire core portfolio actually can now be built with passively managed funds. Okay, so what you say you spoke about target maturity funds, debt index funds, the different kind of passive funds, but tell us a little more about passive debt funds and what investors can gain by investing in this asset class. So many investors know passive equity funds. Passive debt funds are newer, but like passive equity funds, they are funds that follow an index. So the index typically tells you what kind of securities the passive fund could hold, typically the credit quality. So are they holding Government of India securities? Are they holding state development loans? Are they holding AAA PSU? Are they holding AA? Whatever that is. They tell you the tenure of the instrument. That's what the index tells you. And the passive fund's job, once there is an index, is just to replicate the index. The fund manager doesn't take calls. There are rules, and the passive fund replicates the rules. These funds are open-ended, and they tend to be also very low cost, as I said, compared to actively managed mutual funds. The largest category of passively managed mutual funds today is the category of target maturity funds. I want to say they're like open-ended uh, FMPs or mutual fund format FPs. They're basically funds that you buy, that buy and hold bonds that mature in a certain year. It could be 25, it could be 27, it could be 37, whatever it is. Okay, I want to talk a little more, uh, Radhika, about the target maturity for debt funds. But before that, as an investor, what are the things that you need to look at before investing in passive debt funds? I think the same things that you need to look at in active funds, except for the fund manager risk. So you need to understand what the passive debt fund is buying, what kind of, so then fixed income, what are you really interested in? How long are you investing? So you want to know the tenor of the investment. What is the quality of your investment? And that quality is determined by the underlying securities. Now, the securities typically that passive debt funds hold are government of India securities, state development loans, which are sovereign and as good as that, uh, or uh, AAA PSUs like Bharat Bond, which is a very well-known fund, holds AAA public sector uh, companies or AAA corporates. So that those are the two main questions. How long are you investing for? What is the tenure and what is the underlying? Okay, how long, what's the tenure and what is the underlying, right? Uh, so there is a lot of transparency as well. There's no lock-in period, so that works uh, for these funds too. But you know, this passive debt category, the globally, the AUM is massive. Can you help us with some numbers? Globally, what are the numbers looking like and what's the trend that you're expecting in the Indian market in this passive debt category? So globally, interestingly, passive debt funds are the largest growing fixed income category. Uh, and they're the largest growing passive debt category. And I, I've been a real believer of this for the last uh, three years that, you know, in passive, you know, what you in fixed income, passive really brings a lot to the table. So passive today is a 50 lakh crore category globally. Uh, it's 12% of the fixed income category. In fact, in markets like US and Canada, as I said, it's one of the fastest growing categories out there. And passive 
solves the need of debt investors. Debt investors are very sensitive to costs, Sonia, because in equity, at least you have upside that can compensate costs, but in debt, you don't have that. Transparency, which you alluded to, is extremely important for fixed income investors, and we've seen the need for that over the last few years. Liquidity is something passive funds meet. So that's why I think uh, they've been very popular globally, and globally, there's been a lot of innovation in passive fund structures. As far as India, the target maturity category is already 1.4 lakh crore in India in the last three years. That makes it the largest fixed income category after liquid funds, uh, which is actually incredible. And it's been a period where actively managed fixed income funds have degrown in size. They've lost about one and a half lakh crores. So the growth in uh, passives has been breathtaking in the fixed income space over the last three years because they really meet a consumer need. And they take all the right boxes, right? Whether it's lower tax, uh, more predictability in terms of uh, what the upside could be, transparency, there's no lock-in period, uh, more credibility, I guess. So at a time when there's so much uncertainty with equities as an asset class, perhaps a lot of people are resorting to other asset classes, uh, like you said, you know, passive debt funds. But what are the different schemes that are available to invest in within passive debt? So I break the category into two. I would break it into target maturity funds and non-target maturity funds. Target maturity funds are the big part of the category because they're three years old. Uh, as I said, uh, this is basically when you invest in a target maturity fund, there's a date by which the fund matures. It could be 25, it could be 27, it could be uh, 2037. In a passive uh, target maturity fund like 2025, the fund manager basically buys and holds bonds that mature in 2025, and then you do nothing else. You sit there passively. The advantage of this is what you said, predictability of returns. So if I'm an investor who's buying a 2030 product and I'm holding for seven years, I know that if I buy and hold my bonds, regardless of what happens to RBI rate, so many different macro variables, the yield that I saw at the time of investment is likely what I will get at the time of maturity. That predictability of return and that credit quality that it's really good quality securities, AAA PSU has been very powerful for investors. Bharat Bond, of course, was the first target maturity fund after which the market is really expanded. The second category is a new category, which is more constant maturity, uh, constant maturity passive funds. Target maturity funds have a target date. They end on a certain date. Constant maturity funds are perpetual. So they typically have a tenure. It could be one year funds, it could be two years, it could be three years, but they don't mature. They're there for it. Mm. So this target maturity funds, as you said, I mean, you guys do a lot of innovative stuff, right? So there was first the Bharat bond and now there's short duration index funds as well that you've come out with. Tell us a little bit about that. Uh, what is the advantage of putting my money in short duration index funds? So after Bharat Bond and our own other target maturity index funds, we received a lot of feedback from customers that while well, target maturity funds are great, they're great for people who want to invest for the long term. And they're also great for people who know how long they want to invest for. But for a lot of us, there's just money that we have lying out there that could be two-year money, could be three-year money. Uh, we don't know how long we want to park it for. So the target maturity construct doesn't work. And it's also kind of shorter to our money. So, you know, every year or two years, you don't want to be worried about rolling it over. You want the three-year tax advantage that mutual funds have. So can you find us a solution? And what they said is, we like the fact that your passive portfolios are so tri transparent. So bridge this. And that's why this short duration index fund came up. I'm sorry it has such a long name, but it's meant to be very simple. It's meant to be a basic place where you can just park short-term money and let it be. Um, it has a maturity of about two and a half years on average. So if you have two to three year money, you just let it sit there. Okay, well on that note, let's take a quick commercial break on smart money, but don't go anywhere. We'll come back to talk about passive debt funds and how you can add it to your portfolio in just a bit. Welcome back. You're still watching Smart Money on CNBC TV 18. We're speaking to Radhika Gupta of Edelweiss about the growing category of passive debt funds and how you can add it to your portfolio, specifically talking about short-term index funds on the debt category side. You know, the other thing, of course, we want to know is um, which are the schemes that are available to invest for short-term index funds, these short-duration funds that you spoke about? So this one is the first one in the market, uh, this... Uh, Edelweiss, uh, and it's got a very long name, but the Edelweiss uh, 
GSEC short duration fund is the first one in the market. Uh, its typical comparison has been actively managed funds, but I'm hoping just like with Bharat Bond, we opened the market to lots more competition joining. I'm hoping this market will expand because it's genuinely a consumer need. Everyone needs a savings account equivalent that's more efficient where you can park your money. Okay, but you know, uh, at a time like this, right, Radhika, uh, of course, you've tracked both equities and debt very closely, fixed income very closely. How do you feel the asset allocation strategy should change for the full year? I mean, equities looks like it's going to be a very frustrating and painful period this year, may not give people too many returns. There may be a time-wise correction as well amidst this whole global uncertainty. At such a time, do you raise your allocation to debt? If yes, how do you construct your portfolio? You know, I've always been a, a very multi-asset investor. I've been a firm believer in asset allocations, even in the equity heydays. And, you know, uh, years like this, I think, justify that belief. You know, when we see equities, while we are constructive from a three-year point of view, we do know that the next one year is going to be volatile at time. In fact, our equity theme is recessionary conditions before returns. So I think debt is a core part of the portfolio. Now, as far as debt portfolio construction, I have a very simple rule. You break your money into two parts. Money that you need in the short term, which goes into an instrument like the short duration index fund, it's money that you may use for one, two years, two, three years. I may buy a house. I may need some money for construction. I may need it for something. I may not. Otherwise, it can just sit there. And then money that's a little more goal-oriented. The goal-oriented money, like I have goals for three years. I have goals for five years. I have goals for uh, 10 years. I match the timeline with the goals of a target maturity fund and park it there. So that's how I like to do my debt allocation. It's goal-oriented and it divided into two buckets. Money that I may need now and then money that I park away for goals. The short duration index funds, right, that you spoke about, the debt index funds. I mean, just playing the devil's advocate here, if I need the money in the shorter term, I just want to park it for a smaller period of time. I can park it in various other places, whether it's in, uh, say, of course, FDs or in a liquid fund or in a sovereign gold bond or, you know, there are so many other places to park it. Why should I look at short duration funds? So, you know, liquid, of course, liquid, I believe, is not for money that you want to do for two, two to three years because, uh, you know, uh, there is an interest rate spread that you get if you're hanging out for two to three years. FDs work, but, you know, the good thing about a short duration index fund is if you do choose to keep the money for three years, you get the advantage of indexation. Believe me, for those of us who are fully taxing, that becomes very large. So this gives you that optionality uh, of being able to take it out early. But if you happen to keep it for three years, you get the benefit of taxation. And I've seen with a lot of us, Sonia, you know, we think we have short term money. Some of it ends up being long term. So I like the optionality built in something like this. Actually, you know what? I made a mistake. I said sovereign gold bonds. Sovereign gold bonds actually are for the longer term, right? I mean, you get the tax benefits only if you hold it for eight years. Uh, I meant gold ETFs. So that was my other, uh, you know, the other avenue. Yeah. Tell me. You were telling me about gold ETFs? No, gold is, I don't compare gold debt because gold is a little volatile as an asset class, right? It is, it is. So how are you feeling about gold now? I mean, it has done really well compared to equities in the last one year and people are now talking about raising their allocation to gold in their portfolio. You're not a believer of that? You know, we launched a gold fund in August last year, a gold and silver fund, uh, and it's up a lot of money. But I said then what I'm going to say now, which is that I think gold should be a static allocation in your portfolio. Um, it could be 5 to 10%. I feel investors do a terrible job of timing gold, and I remember this from my own NFO. So I think not trying to time gold and just keeping there at 5 to 10% works much better than trying to time it. Okay, by the way, you know, before we wrap up, uh, it, uh, congratulations are in order, Radhika, because Edelweiss has crossed the 1 lakh crore AUM milestone and it's a big deal, right? I mean, I have watched your journey over the last 10 to 15 years and it's been phenomenal, the growth that you have seen and now the growth that you've brought to Edelweiss. So, congratulations. But do you think that a lot of this also has to do with the massive rise that we've seen in the equity cult, right, in the Indian markets, especially with retail investors? And do you think that's here to stay? I think it is. And, you know, I'm, I'm very thankful for the growth. And, you know, the wonderful thing is I think mutual funds have become so mainstream. They've become part of popular culture almost. Uh, we've seen our equity AUM grow by 15 times in the last five years. We've seen our fixed income AUM come from basically zero to what it is to being a top 10 player in fixed income. And I think the young Indian investor, the Indian investor is getting more aware about their money. They want to financialize more. 
they're also getting more aspirational about their money. And that's where you see the rise in equity. And I genuinely do believe that while one lakh is a meaningful milestone, I do believe our MF industry will go from 40 to 100 lakh crores. And you know we will also go from one to two and much larger. So I'm very optimistic about the future because financialization is just starting to kick in. Absolutely, I totally agree with you. And now we're, of course, you know, with the onset of digi digitization, you're seeing easier ways to sort of get into the financial market and invest your money. Uh, tell me a little bit about, uh, you know, the, let's get back to the topic, of course, with respect to passive funds and passive debt funds. Uh, what kind of an average return would you expect, both in the short term index funds as well as overall in the passive debt category over the next couple of years? Okay, so I think the short term index fund uh, YTMs are between seven to seven and a half. I mean, you know, it changes given the day, it could be 7.1, 7.2. And I think that's where sort of short term rates are likely to be. Uh, we do think we are close to the end of the rate hike and rates are not going to go down in a hurry. Uh, so perhaps the timing of this one is also good. Uh, for longer term passive, uh, you know, debt funds, the target maturity series, it really depends on where you are in the yield curve. But we have products all the way from 2023 till 2037, which sounds like a long time away. And I think they go from 7.1 all the way to 7.7. .7. So that's kind of where you should be. And I should take the opportunity to re-highlight that most people don't realize that post-tax on a mutual fund platform, you end up paying tax with indexation and tax works out to 10, 12%. So you really versus a traditional instrument end up being better off. So with this passive debt category picking up in India over the last two to three years, Radhika, do you see investors hunting for diversified products? Do you see that switch from equities to uh, fixed income or to debt increase? Or is it largely still skewed towards equities? No, I don't think equity and debt, you know, sort of uh, are the comparison points. I think equity has its place in the portfolio. Uh, it's a risk-taking asset class. I think with passive debt funds, where we are seeing money come from is erstwhile tax free because we are 50% of this very, very large market and growing market. Uh, we see money come from tax-free bond investors. We see money come from fully taxable FD investors who now want to enjoy the predictability with much lower taxation. So we see it come from these categories. We see many first time fixed income MF investors come in because of target maturity funds, because finally they've found a product that's safe, that's predictable, that's low cost. So debt and equity, I've always believed are different parts of the asset allocation, but investors who never used debt mutual funds or who use things like FDs or tax-free bonds are now coming to uh, passive debt, debt funds. So that's where we see the growth coming from. Okay, I'm sure there are, there's a big party happening at Edelweiss now with the 1 lakh crore AUM uh, milestone getting hit. So are we looking at the IPO coming anytime soon? Uh, you know, that's it's a great aspiration to have, Sonia. I think we're focused on building a high-quality business, uh, a profitable business, which we've got to. And hopefully in the next few years, we can scale it uh, to a point uh, where we become a listed company at some point. It would make all of us very proud. Okay, Radhika, it's always a pleasure speaking with you. Get to learn so much from you. Thanks a lot for joining in. Just one last question before we let you go. Because, you know, the topic of this week or the topic of the last uh, many weeks has been what's happening with the churn in the market with respect to different sectors, right? There are new age tech companies that are coming back. There was this whole Adani group fiasco. Consumption is slowing down in a big way and a lot of foreign investors are talking about it as well. Um, what are the themes that you like now? Not just at Edelweiss, but personally as well. What are the sectoral themes that you like? We think this is a decade of India, India manufacturing, beneficiaries of PLI. So the themes that are sort of in our portfolio are long domestic India. So it is uh, industrials, uh, it is capital goods, uh, it is beneficiaries of a pickup in private uh, capex, PLI, indigenization of defense. And I think the second theme that goes hand in hand with this is financials, uh, especially lending financials, because they benefit from this stage and this uptick in the economy. So we really believe it's going to be, you know, a very special decade for these themes. Uh, and that's what we're overweight on. That's, that's my personal uh, view as well. Uh, and things that we're underweight on are, uh, typically things that tend to be more export oriented because global conditions uh, 
this time are more challenged for his domestic conditions. All right, uh, Radhika Gupta, always a pleasure speaking with you. And once again, congratulations uh, to you and to the entire team at Edelweiss for achieving this one lakh crore milestone in the AUM. Uh, so thanks a lot for joining in and all the best for the future. Thank you, Sonia. Okay, with that, folks, it's a wrap on this edition of Smart Money. As always, keep writing to us. Thanks for watching.